okay so good morning to you all uh, so today let us take up the final part of the stress part uh, so before we go the detailed details of the stress part so let me give you a little more introduction uh, let me or uh, let me add a little more to the stress part so what is the fundamental meaning so how the stress part make a sense and how to utilize or how to understand in practical view point the applicability of the stress path so on and so forth. So just to understand, so yesterday uh, I have given a brief introduction about uh, what is stress path, how the mohar column failure envelope is different from the stress path, so on and so forth. Uh, today, let us try to further enrich our knowledge on the stress path. So for that, so let me give you a small introduction. So later I will explain about all these things. See, for example, I am taking another Mohor circuit where I can better explain about so the necessity of the stress path. What we have done is, so initially we applied some stress and we reached to the final. So this is the initial stress condition and this is the final stress condition. So this is sigma 3i and sigma 1i and this is sigma 3f and this is sigma 1f. So I have taken uh, so a simple sample so where the sample is subjected to the loading condition and that loading conditions are represented in the form of a Mohr circuit. So here I designates the initial condition say we can presume that so the sample is consolidated under uniform cell pressure. While we keep on increasing the axial load until the sample fails. Now suppose if you draw for these two extreme conditions the Mohr circuits. So the Mohr circuits something look like this. Initial condition stresses and the final condition stresses. Now from the basic definition of the stress path it is a line which joins the low keys of all the Mohr circuits. So here so this is low key of the initial condition and this is the low key of the final condition. Now if I join these two points, if I join these two points, so that can be defined as your stress path. So this is called as a stress path. So it is a line which is joining the points of so the locus of all the more circle that is called as a stress path. Now just understand very carefully now we are simply superimposed to the initial condition of the loading on the soil sample and the final condition of the loading on the soil sample. But in between, what path did you follow? Is it straight line path or is it something like this way or this way or this way, this way, this way, this way? Which path did you follow? So all these are called as a stress pass only. Suppose if I know the initial point and final point, I can join these points by the infinite number of lines. It is possible. Okay, I can join these two points either by simple straight line or by any other infinite number of lines. So that means each line represents a particular stress path. Or the other way around of understanding this one is each line indicates how the stress has been applied on the soil sample. Now, suppose from this condition to this condition, say A to the B to the B. So I can increase the stress condition such a way that so I can play with either delta sigma 1 or delta sigma 3. Or other way around of understanding is delta sigma B and delta sigma H. Depending upon the magnitude of the delta sigma v and delta sigma h, you get a stress path that may be a linear, may be a non-linear, or may be a this king, or may be the above the king. So fundamentally, what you need to understand is between A to B, what is happening? Are you increasing the sigma v alone by keeping the sigma h constant? Then if that is the case, how the stress path look like or other way around vice versa sigma v is constant 
sigma h only increased then how the stress path looks like okay just imagine so these are all hypothetical conditions but they may be possible in practicality or uh, i am increasing the stresses such a way that sigma v is equals to the sigma h or uh, i am increasing so i am just writing all these conditions so in between so in between so the infinite number of possibilities so sigma h is equals to sigma v h is equals to delta sigma v so from a to b i am increasing my load such that the vertical load improvement increment is equals to the horizontal load r r so delta sigma v is half that of delta sigma h half that of sigma h r one third of delta sigma h one third of delta sigma h that means depending upon the loading condition <coughs> depending upon the loading condition your stress path might vary your stress path might vary so a bit of it has to be understood but so this is the very fundamental so why you always see improvement in delta sigma v or delta sigma h this is the reason this is the reason now for better understanding i have taken another case so in case of the clay soil sample where it is subjected to the unconsolidated undrained test or consolidated undrained test or normally an over consolidated clay how the stress path look like so first for example you take the uu test conducted on the normally consolidated clay uu test conducted uh, sorry conducted on normally consolidated clay so here so if you take the initial condition initial condition it is unconsolidated undrained so therefore there is a possibility of the development of the pore water present there is a possibility of the development of the pore water present so here if you look at since no water is allowed to expel from outside soil soil sample whatever the stresses that will get developed on are in the form of a total stress so whatever the load that you increase in the axial direction if you draw that stress path so it something look like in the inclined direction it is a straight line so it is a straight line okay so at any point of time it is only the straight line but suppose at any point of time if you are interested to allow the dissipation of the pore water pressure then suddenly you are converting the stress condition from the total to the effective so this effective stress condition for normally consolidated clays always exists on the left side of the total tsp total tsp okay but one more condition that you need to understand uh if you take the practical condition so there is a possibility of the existence of the ground water table existence of the ground water table so how do you account for the existence of the ground water table and its impact in terms of the pore water present that is simply designated as static pore water present so here i have shown you for example if you see so the ground water table is uh, represented in the form of a static pore water present static means it is a constant as long as the ground water table is remain same so long the static pore water present acts on the soil sample so that's what is the meaning of static pore water present now if anybody is asking in how many ways i can able to draw the stress path is there are three number of ways of drawing the stress path the very first one is total stress path this we understood and next if you measure the pore water present then what we get is effective stress path that is esp but suppose if there exists a ground water table so in the field and that is acting some kind of the static pore water present so how do you account for that static pore water present is by drawing another stress path that is called as a total stress minus static pore water present that is called as a tssp tssp so this is total stress path and uh, if the sample is subjected to constant ground water level and that is represented in the form of a static pore water present that is represented as total stress minus static pore water present okay 
So this is what normally consolidated clay. This is for normally consolidated clay under the CU test. Under CU test. Now in CU test, we consolidate the soil sample initially, but thereafter the valve is closed. That point is something here. So up to this point, or from this point, what to do after application of the uniform cell pressure? So till that point, there was no pore water present. So the sample is remains same. Then uh, after the soil completely got consolidated, then you will start increasing the axial stress by closing the valve. So as a result of the valve closing, you keep developing the pore water pressure. You keep developing the pore water. Pressure. So this is initial condition. So the TSSP is the initial condition of the soil sample. And uh, so this line, this non-linear line indicates the effective stress path. It indicates the way in which the water is getting expelled out from the soil sample. So other way around is, we can understand how the water is getting expelled out from the soil sample. So at any point, the difference between the TSSSP and ESP is nothing but the pore pressure that was initially developed as a result of the application of the axial stress. Okay, so this is for the normally consolidated clay. But in case of the over consolidated clay, so something other things will happen. Now, in case of the normally consolidated clay, the pore pressure is always the positive. The pore water pressure is always the positive, meaning thereby, so the moment you close the valve, the water starts bearing some amount of the load. But in over consolidated clay, it's a reverse. So initially only small amount of the pore pressure develops. So if you look at the total stress path and effective stress path and total minus static pore water pressure. So this is the initial condition that is the total stress path. Then if it exists some amount of the static uh, groundwater developer, static pore water pressure. So this is U0. So this static pore water pressure is representation of the groundwater level. That this is called as a TSSSP. Stat total stress path minus static pore water. Okay, so after that, now you started so increasing the axial load, but by closing the valve, by closing the valve. Now, in case of the NC clay, you always see only the positive pore water pressure because the sample constantly gets consolidated, and as a result of the consolidation, so there is a volume change. That volume change is measured in terms of the dissipation of the pore water pressure. So as the amount of the volume of the water getting expelled, so equal amount of the soil particles adjustment will take place. While in case of the over consolidated clay, over consolidated, there is no particle adjustment that can happen resulting in volume change, compression. Rather, so there is no possibility of the particle arrangement. But since on the already highly compacted soil sample, you are applying the axial load. So what they do is, the particles, rather than compression, they will try to dilate. So instead of the volume decrement, there is a volume increment. That is called as a dilation. So there is a small dilation. So but initially, so the moment we apply the load, there may be small positive pore water pressure. Small positive pore water pressure. But as you further increase the load, so the positive will be turned into the negative. The positive will be turned into the negative pore water pressure. So now you can see. So ESP, in case of the NC clay, which is always moving away from the total stress path, because the because of the constant positive pore water pressure. But in case of the over consolidated clay, the ESP initially on the left side of the TSP total stress path. But as the pore water pressure turns to the negative, maybe with a very short period of time, then ESP moves to the right side of the total stress path. Total stress path. Okay. So this is how you can able to distinguish the stress path for uh, normally consolidated clay or over consolidated clay. So under UU loading or under CU loading. I hope uh, it is clear to everyone. So if you have a
Yeah, if you have any question, uh, you can please ask me. Sir. Yeah. Sir, how to decide KF line from this uh, three diagram? How to decide? KF line, sir. Uh, that I will come to. I will explain you the KF. Line. Okay. So one fundamental thing that uh, yesterday also I was explaining, when you draw the relationship between P versus Q, it is always called as a KF line. So that is constant pressure line. So that I will come to now. So do you have any question in this regard? Okay. So now, so let me explain the more about the stress path, the KF line, so on and so forth. So now here, so as I told, so this is the initial and final condition. So in between, depending upon the increment of the load, either in the axial direction or the lateral direction, so you may get the stress point. Now let us take a small example. So this is, uh, this is Q or Q dash. So this is P or P dash. Okay. So now, so let us take the conditions of sigma h is equals to sigma v. So sigma h is equals to sigma v. So then what will happen to P0 and Q0? Can anybody tell me? Where is this point? Sigma h is equals to sigma v. And so sigma h is equals to, so sigma v is equals to 0. So what is the value of P0 and Q0? So the third is, so sigma h is not equals to, sigma v is not equals to 0. So what is, sorry, what is P0? Where would be this point and where would be this point? Sir, so what is, have you written in second one? So sigma h is equals to sigma v. So what is the value of the P0 and Q0? So we know, so this, is not, so this is sigma V plus sigma H by 2. So this is sigma V minus sigma H by 2. So this is nothing but either sigma V or sigma H, na? Yes, sir. And this is 0. 0. <laughs> okay, while well, in this case, both are zeros only. Sir, what is written? It is not looking, sir. This one? Yes, sir. H is equal to sigma V is equal to 0. In case A, sigma H is equal to sigma V. Then try to determine P0 and Q0. Case B, sigma H is equals to sigma v is equals to 0. Then calculate P0 and Q0. Case 3, sigma h is not equals to sigma v is not equals to 0. So both are some positive values. So then, so then what is the value of the P0 and Q0? Is this all right? Suppose if sigma h is equal to sigma v, then this is 2 sigma v by 2, that is either sigma v or sigma h. So no problem. While sigma v is equal to sigma h, this will get cancelled out, q0 becomes 0. Then in case of sigma h is equal to sigma v is equal to 0, then both the points are 0. Then if sigma h is a some positive, some definite value, Sigma V is some definite value, both are not equal to 0. Then in this case, so it is Sigma V plus Sigma H by 2 and Sigma V minus Sigma H by 2. But this is not equal to this. So P0 is not equal to Q0. So E0 equal to Q0. 
So the third case, it depends upon uh, the type of uh, trial cell test we perform. Exactly. Okay. Now, can you try to identify these three points on this diagram? So P not one, P not two, P not three. Where is the P not one? Next axis. On the x axis. Somewhere here. Is it all right? Yes, sir. And where is P not two? What is it? And where is P not three? So it can be on the right side or left side depending upon the type of test. Yeah, depending upon the type of the test. It could be above or below or right or left. So just for understanding purpose, I'm taking somewhere here. So this is P03. Okay, so that means uh, you can you can have a three variety of initial conditions, basically. We can have a initial condition where you are simply applying the cell pressure, uniform cell pressure, or isotropic loading condition. Got it? This something represents isotropic loading condition. In case two, so the sample is simply grabbed out from the ground where it is not subjected to any kind of axial or lateral stress. The third condition, it is some intermediate point or it represents some stresses acting on the soil element at some depth. At some depth. So if you uh, try to draw in the form of a small uh, elements. So this is how we can represent. So this is sigma v is equals to sigma c. Sorry. So sigma v is equals to sigma c and sigma h is equals to sigma c. While second condition so second condition, so this is 0, 0, 0, 0. While the last one, third condition, third condition, so this is sigma h and this is sigma v, where sigma h is not equals to sigma v. So you may start with any one of these three initial conditions, you must remember. You may start with any one of these three initial conditions. Now, let me take the very first initial condition of sigma h is equals to sigma v. Now, I know this initial point. I know this initial point. After the sample has subjected to the isotropic loading condition, what I am doing is now, I am increasing the load, I am increasing the load such that your delta sigma v is uh, you can say half that of delta sigma h. Okay, now suppose if I want to know another point, so from uh, since I am starting from here, so P, point number P1 is nothing but, so P0 plus delta P, P0 plus delta P. Or uh, in some books you can see that the P1 is written as, so sigma V plus delta sigma, uh, so here it is written, sigma v plus uh, delta sigma h, or delta sigma v plus sigma h plus delta sigma h divided by 2. Similarly, q1 is equals to, so sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma h plus delta sigma h divided by 2 divided by now we can take any condition we can assume so now if you look at the next point p1 and q1 so this comprises of increasing load in the axial direction plus increasing load in the lateral direction so you need to have both the components I think this, in fact, this equation is very rational to understand. So, how the P1 and Q1 will change? 
Okay. Now assume the condition that sigma delta sigma v is half that of delta sigma h. Now, what do you mean by the delta sigma v? That is increase in the the change in increase in the axial load. Similarly, delta sigma h is change in the lateral stress. It may be increment or it may be decrement. Now, I have given the condition. So, can we able to uh, compute the P1 and Q1? What is the P1 and what is the Q1? But here, to solve this one, you need to understand one fundamental thing. So, I have started from the condition of the P0. At that condition, your sigma v is equals to sigma h. Sigma v is equals to sigma h. So to determine the p naught, so to determine the p naught, or sorry, p1, so this is sigma v plus delta sigma v plus, so you are coming from the initial condition only. At initial condition, your sigma v is equals to sigma h is equal to sigma c. So there is no problem. So plus, so delta, uh, sorry, uh, okay. This is half of the delta sigma h. Half of delta sigma h and sigma v plus, so delta sigma h divided by 2. So this can be written as, so 2 delta sigma v plus, this is 1 plus 1 and half. How much? The so 1. 1 plus 1. 1 plus half, 1 and half, na? So this is so sigma h plus half delta sigma h. Three by two. Three by two. So this is three by two into so delta sigma h. We have to write. Okay. So divided by two. So this can be written as sigma v plus. So, 3 by 4 into delta sigma h. 3 by 4 into delta sigma h. In fact, you should write in uh, delta sigma v form. Or you can write this in the form of a delta sigma v. So, delta sigma v plus 3 fourth into 2 times of delta sigma v. So, this will become your delta sigma v plus 3 by 2 into delta sigma 3 by 2 into delta sigma So similarly, so try to calculate, try to calculate Q1. Q1. So that is sigma v sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma v because sigma h is equal to sigma v minus 2 times of delta sigma v divided by 2. So this, this will cancel out. So minus minus so delta sigma v. So this is uh, yeah this will become minus delta sigma v. Is it alright? Check it once. Yes, sir, it's correct. Yeah. So that means another point is so P1 is equals to sigma v plus 3 by 2 into delta sigma v and Q1 is equals to minus sigma v. Minus sigma v. So that will be somewhere either this side or this side. This side or this side. Anywhere you can form. So for that you need to you can determine the slope of this one. So this can be if you write this as so 5 by 2 into delta sigma v, you can take the ratio. So one second, one second, sir. So yeah. So in the Q1, you had uh, written sigma v plus delta sigma v minus sigma h plus delta sigma h by 2. Correct. So in the second term, you had write, written sigma v again. I think... Uh, no. 
So that's what I'm saying. See, this is the equation. This sigma v and sigma h are initial conditions. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Then that is isotropic condition. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then fine. Sir, so sigma v uh, minus sigma v by two, sir. So q1 equal to minus sigma v by two. Minus sigma v by two. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So minus sigma v by two. Now, suppose here one value is positive, another value is negative. Just to avoid the confusion, you take the ratio. So that is minus delta sigma v by two by the p is that is two by five into so delta sigma v. So this will this will cancel out. So you will get the slope of minus one fifth. Minus one. Fifth. Sir. So plus, yeah. Sir, why we are doing this? This is to understand the slope. See, for example, from here I can draw a line at any direction. Okay, so your every the line has some slope, either positive slope or the negative slope. So these are the some slope values. Okay, this slope indicates whether it is uh, going above the p line or going below the p line. So we have. Sigma v plus p by two delta sigma v. How can it be five by two delta sigma v? Yes, sir. It is sigma v, not as delta sigma v, no, sir. So how can we add? Oh, sorry, sir. No. Sorry, sir. Okay. So if you substitute the values, then if you get the ratio, that is fine. Okay. So the values of the if you take the ratio of q1 by q1, it indicates from the initial point you may be moving the above p above the x-axis or below the x-axis or in inclined direction or in the vertical direction. So just for understanding, I will give you some examples uh, so that you can better understand. So this can also create some kind of a confusion. See, for example, if delta sigma h is equals to minus delta sigma v minus delta sigma v, then it moves in the vertical direction. It moves in the vertical direction. On the other hand, on the other hand. If delta sigma h is zero and delta sigma v is greater than zero, then you will get this inclined line. You will get this inclined line. On the other hand, suppose if we keep delta sigma v as zero, zero, and delta sigma h greater than zero, then you will get this slope line or this stress point. Okay, so having demonstrated how to calculate the delta p values, that is uh, either p1 or q1 value, then using the same thing, so you can draw these stress lines. You can substitute any ratio between delta sigma v and delta sigma h. So for better understanding, I have given the stress form. Where if you take delta sigma h is equals to minus delta sigma v, you will get the stress path in the vertical direction. Alternatively, if you assume there was no change in the confining pressure, you are only increasing the axial stress, then your stress path is something in the inclined direction. On the other hand, so if you keep the axial stress remain constant or zero. If there is no change in the axial stress, 
but rather if you increase the lateral stress, then you will get the stress path on the other direction. So, so if delta sigma v is equal to half of delta sigma h so will it be inclined at 45 degree i don't think so <laughs> that may not possible okay similarly so here i have started from my initial condition of sigma v is equals to sigma h. Well, you may get the same stress path, suppose if you start from the origin. So, in that case, the stress path may be something like this. Okay, or alternatively, suppose if your initial condition is this one, then again you will get the stress path something like this. So, where you are taking the initial point is that is the most important. So, that indicates so the initial condition of the soil sample, whether it is subjected to the isotropic loading condition or no loading condition at all, or there is some initial, no, sorry, uh, some axial and lateral stress condition. So now, alternatively, uh, what they found is, see now you are increasing delta sigma h, that is the lateral stress, or delta sigma v, that is the axial stress. But sometimes you may come across the loading uh, with a constant stress ratio. So loading with constant stress ratio. So that is represented as so the ratio of sigma sorry sigma h by sigma v. So this is typically defined as k at the present coefficient. At the present coefficient. Loading with constant stress ratio, meaning thereby the improvement of the stress in the lateral direction is equal to the increment of the stress in the axial direction. The rate of increment is remains same in the vertical as well as in the horizontal direction. So that ratio is represented as k. Now suppose if we assume that so there is no lateral strain that is there is no lateral strain, then that condition is called as a K naught condition. K naught condition. So this is simply represented as so sigma v sigma h by sigma v. Or it is represented as coefficient of lateral pressure at rest. So and where K naught is lateral at the present or the coefficient of lateral at the present at rest. If we assume that there is no lateral strain, then that condition so typically falls under K naught condition where K naught is called as a so coefficient of at present at rest. Increase the lateral and axial stress until the sample fails. Then that condition is called as a KF. That is sigma H, either effective stress or the total stress. KF line. Okay, so there are other some relations also available. So you can see it. You can refer to any of the book. Now in some books, 
so we can also see uh, the correlations are the same stress paths they are represented in the form of a earth pressure earth pressure r so when you superimpose this pf lines so on the p dash q curve what how do you represent This is P R P dash, and this is Q dash. Suppose K is equals to one. So this line is called as a. K is equals to one, and this is K less than one, and this is K. Similarly, this is K greater than one, and this is K plus. Sir, yeah. Sir, how can we decide the critical stress uh, from this PF PQ graph, sir? We have to draw the Mohr circle to de determine the critical stress, so that we can find the KF. No, no, KF line is nothing but your uh, the stress path line only, na? Your KF line is just recall the yesterday's tutorial one of the example. So there, for the given data, we have drawn the Mohr circle separately. We have drawn the KF line separately. Suppose if you have drawn the KF line, where the slope of this KF line is represented as xi, and suppose from the KF line, if we want to determine the angle of internal friction, so that is related as Sin pi is equals to tan xi. So just recall. So tan pi sin pi is equals to tan xi. Okay. R. So if you want to determine the C value, that is the cohesion. C is equals to a by cos pi. So from p p dash q dash graph. So whatever you are getting the stress path in the form of a KF line. If at all, if you want to determine the angle of internal friction or cohesion of the soil sample, you first try to measure what is the inclination made by the KF line, which is represented as xi, and the correlation is available between angle of internal friction versus xi, that is sin pi is equal to tan xi. So this is for uh, The frictional material. Suppose in case of the C pi soil, so this equation is still valid. And if you want to determine the C value, so which can be determined by the A by cos pi, where A is the intercept with the ordinate. Intercept with the ordinate. Is this okay, Vishal? Is this clear to your doubt? Yes, sir. Means sir, KF line is just the lock uh, by joining the locus of all uh, more circle, na sir? Correct. Correct. Okay. 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 Okay.
टुडे आई हैव एंड अंडरस्टैंड सर व्हाई वी हैव डन दिस होल प्रोसेस सर कैन यू प्लीज मेक द ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ टुडेस लेक्चर See, for example, this is the ground surface, original ground. Okay, I am taking two examples. Case one, case two. Suppose if you take a small element. small element at any depth so this will be subjected to both sigma h and sigma v sigma h and sigma v so on the case two also i am simply taking so another soil element so here also it is sigma h and this is sigma v okay now just imagine In case ये I started applying the loading condition. While in case B, I started excavating. This is loading. While this is excavation. This is excavation. Okay. Now what is the difference between this case and this case? so for the first case we apply the delta sigma okay we apply delta sigma in this case the overburden is reduced to minimize और बड़े नहीं रहते हो, so minus delta sigma, okay? Now further excavate, आ further apply the load, and keep on applying the load, आ keep on excavating, keep on excavating. Now here when you are applying the loads in a phased manner, phased manner. so what is happening to the stresses inside the element at a point and when you are excavating in a phased manner what are happening to the stresses so at a particular uh, stresses on a soil element at a particular depth okay so are, are you not playing with when you excavate you are removing the delta sigma when you impose the load are you not putting the delta sigma and consequently so you just recall so what is came out there is no lateral strain no lateral strain this may be one condition ah uh, so you may arrive at the condition where see the moment we apply the vertical load there is also change in the horizontal stress but what is the relationship between the increment of the vertical load and the corresponding increment or decrement in the lateral stress okay so are you able to represent all these change in the stress conditions using your mohr circuits have you done that exercise yes sir where so we don't have uh, we don't done exercise but we can plot this uh, uh, this whole change into more circles sir but how many more circles will you draw yes up to failure sir but up to failure that's okay okay so the yes you can draw the number of more circles but it is a cumbersome process it is a cumbersome process so suppose if you recall you are 
the simple definition of the stress path what we have done so we have joint we have joint loci of all the points that is called as a stress path this is called as a stress path while here suppose if you take every loci so i know so this is represented as a p this is represented as a q and this is nothing but you are sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 or this is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2. so instead of drawing so many number of more circles and identifying the loci point why don't you directly identify the loci point or why don't you directly calculate this loci point by simply computing the p value and q value and to the corresponding change in the axial and the lateral stress so in that case you don't need to draw the so many number of more circles you are directly arriving at the loci point so when i say all this kf line or all this stress path those are the points joining the more circle the same okay but which is not which is not equal to more coulomb failure angle which is a tangent to the more circle so that's how that's how you need to distinguish between the mohr coulomb failure envelope and the stress path okay again so now suppose say this is the stress path this you understood now just now i have explained so many conditions say for example so you have started with the initial condition of the sigma c is equals to the sigma v is equals to sigma c is equals to sigma h we have started from here now say uh, this i can say as a kf line that means the free loop line but now i have started from the initial condition now i should understand which direction i will be moving towards the free loop so if i directly move in the vertical direction then i will soon arrive at the free loop but if i move in the inclined direction so i may take little longer time suppose if i take this inclination i will very soon arrive the failure condition yes sir so is this answer your question yes sir so like in more circle we have a, a more co um, coulomb failure in all of sir that is the failure line in our stress in our this stress path we have a kf line is a failure line okay yes okay so just not only a small sum uh, so a sample was uh, So now I am trying to solve the problem. So an unconfined, sorry, an undisturbed sample of saturated clay soil is consolidated to an all-round stress of 60. Sorry, this is 60 kilopascal, not 10. So an undisturbed sample of saturated clay soil is consolidated. to an all round stress of 60 kilo pascals the following stress changes are then imposed under undrained condition until the value of the sigma 1 until the value of the sigma 1 reaches to 170 kilo pascals so the sample initially was consolidated with a cell pressure of 60 kilo pascal so but consolidation means there was a drainage valve open so therefore till the end of the consolidation there was no development of the pore water pressure now later they closed the valve thereby they developed the undrained condition and they started increasing the axial stress until sigma 1 has reached 170 kilo pascals okay now just recall the very first diagram you are at the initial condition that is isotropic condition now you have been given the final stress condition of the sigma 1 is equal to 170 in between in between 
what kind of the changes that has occurred for the nodes in the lateral direction as well as in the vertical direction. See this. So I have only increased the axial stress that is in the positive, but my the lateral stresses there is no increment. Try to understand always. Delta sigma 3 means your 60 kilopascal of the cell pressure existed, but behind that there is no improvement. The 60s remain constant. Delta means change. Change. Okay. So keeping delta sigma 3 remained constant. Sorry, see, keeping cell pressure as a constant. So we have increased the axial stress until sigma 1 is reaching 170 kilopascals. Now, uh, during the testing, they also measured core pressure parameters B that is equals to 1, which, is indi which indicates that the soil is maintaining a degree of saturation of 100% and A of 0.5. A of 0 0.5. So sketch the total and effective stress path for the undrained loading and calculate the pore pressure in the soil at the end of the loading. Sketch total and effective stress paths for the undrained loading and calculate the pore pressure in the soil at the end of the loading. At the end of the So we have solved one of the similar problem yesterday. So you can do the same analogy. So what is the initial condition? So P naught is so sigma V plus sigma h by 2. So here it is the cell pressure. So 60 plus 60 by 2. So this is 120 by 2. This is 60 kPa. And where q naught is? So sigma v minus so sigma h by 2. So this is 0. So this is 0. So now for second point, so this is uh, point number one and for point number two, so you need to uh, determine what is delta sigma 3 is 0 that is given. What is delta sigma 1 here? One hundred ten kilopascal. 110. So this is 170 minus 60. So this is 110 kilopass. So now since four pressure parameters are given A and B, so you can able to determine the delta U. What is the correlation? Delta U is equal to delta U D plus delta U C. It is uh... no no both are there the A and B. So B into yeah so B into so delta, delta sigma three plus, plus a, a, a into delta sigma plus one minus delta sigma three delta sigma three okay so this is one and what is the delta sigma three this is zero a is being given as so zero point five and delta sigma one is so one ten minus 0. So this will give around 55 kilopascals. So the pore pressure that gets developed is 55 kilopascals as a result of the application of or as a result of increasing the axial stress up to 170 kilopascals.
So, what is the second point P1 and Q1? Yeah, actually, we have us this time. Okay. So, try to determine the P1 and Q1. So, P1 is 150 kilopascal. 15, sir. 115. 115 kilopascal. And Q1 is equal to 55 kilopascal. So, Q1 is equal to 55 kilopascal. Others, please confirm. Okay, but this is corresponding to total stress or effective stress? The total. Yeah, so this is corresponding to total stress. Okay, what about effective stress? So P1 dash and Q1 dash. See, one thing is clear. As Q1 is something to do with the negative, so there will not be any change in the Q1, both for the total or effective. So, you should not bother about the Q1. Q1 is not impacted by the change in pore water pressure because you can see the relation. Suppose if you draw this one in effective stresses, so sigma V dash minus sigma H dash by 2, so what both will get cancelled out. Sigma V minus U, so this is minus sigma H plus U divided by 2. So this, this will get cancelled out. So again you arrive at the same initial condition. So therefore your Q either in terms of the total or effective remains same. And just try to determine the P dash in terms of the effective stress. Which is straightforward I think. 115 so 60 kilo pascal. 115 minus? 55. 115 minus 50. This is 60 kilo pascal. Okay, so this is effective stress. Sir, Q1 dash equal to 0, sir. No, cannot be 0, no? Q is not impacted by change in pore water pressure. That's what I told you. Your Q will not impacted by change in pore water pressure. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we can draw the stress path. See, for example, uh, if you draw the Q or Q dash and P or P dash. So the initial point is 60 kilopascals. So this is 60 comma 0. 60 comma 0. And next point is 115 comma 55. So 115 comma 55. So this is total TSP. TSP. So next, uh, the in terms of the effective stress, so 60 comma 55. So same. This vertical line. So this is 60 comma 55. So this is ESP, effective stress part. So is this clear to everyone? Okay. 